someone asked me um, about cone beam and what it can do with the photos. So those people who already have Serona, this is what it does as it takes photos. It's kind of amazing, right? So the same 3D scan is, um, so if you presented these photos uh, with and without a smile, it just saves one or two. And then this is what I call the wow factor. I um, can superimpose this over that. Um, this girl came in because um, her um, uh, husband was complaining that she was um, uh, snoring a lot, um, which is normally unusual, it's not the other way around, you know. Um, so what we're able to do with the records, I can do a 3D off her airway, can, can you see? Um, and I can do that while she postures her jaw forward and see if it opens up the airway, is she a good candidate for a uh, you know, mandibular repositioning appliance. So there's, with 3D, there's just, it's, it's, it's kind of like getting um, the latest windows. You'll never use all the bells and whistles on it, but geez, it's high technology, right? Um, but the one x-ray, people talk about exposure, remember, a cone beam with all the data you get is the equivalent of the older Ceph frontal OPG. Uh, and even then, you're talking, what, 25 days of... Um, background scatter radiation. So in other words, a, a holiday in Spain. <laughs> I really don't see the big drama, honestly. Right? And I found from your thing that, oh, this CVM is all hocus pocus. Uh, Angle Orthodontist did a long-term review on, on growth and development, showed this was the most accurate scientific method. That's Angle Orthodontist. I'll give you a copy of that, you can send it to your mate. Yeah. Um, because it's just like, you know, admit that you don't know what you're doing and get on with it rather than trying to say, oh, that's not evidence-based and that's why we don't take um, x-rays. Could be your personality too, Ian. I, I just wanted to point that out to you, right? <laughs> it sounds like you have a lot more problems than most people. I don't know how I can say that politically. <laughs> just kidding. Um, as general dentist, um, doing orthodontics, I guess the common problems you guys are faced with is lack of room for canines, airway, and, and habits. I think that's a good sort of summary. Thumb sucking, um, we all know, uh, has negative consequences, um, but breaking it is sometimes not an easy thing to do. Uh, there's all sorts of theories why people suck their thumb, uh, but the bottom line is, if you persist in sucking your thumb past the age of um, three to four, you are gonna get changes in the palate. People always say, as long as you stop sucking before the adult teeth come through, you're right. That's absolutely a misnomer because we're not worried so much about the adult teeth. They can always be fixed with braces. We're worried about the shape of the palate. Does that make sense? And the younger the kid, the easier it is for them to mold the palate. Now, people who don't believe in functionals You've got to ask yourself, what is the thumb doing to the palate? That's acting like a functional appliance, but incorrectly. If you had a kid who was class three, mid-face deficient, I'd encourage them to suck their thumb. Because what are they doing? They're pushing their pre-maxilla out at the right age. You understand? Right? Um, so you had a patient, you were saying that, um, you know, sucks a thumb and they're in mixed or early dentition, right? So to me, this is the most effective way. This is a thing called a thumb guard. Thumb guard um, is made by a US company called Med Etal, M-E-D-E-T-A-L. Um, and basically, the guy who developed it was an engineer, Eugene Zilber. And he developed it because his daughter kept sucking her thumb and he tried everything. Um, I had a similar problem with my daughter. And back then, I didn't know anything. We put chili on her thumb and we notice now she loves Thai food, right? Um, it didn't stop, is what I'm saying. The little glove on the hand at night, yeah, it doesn't work, yeah? Only two things work. Something fixed in the palate, which I go to if there's a need to expand simultaneously. Do you understand? But if there's not a need to expand, meaning a younger kid, the damage not already done, you just want to break the habit, this is really good. This comes in three sizes and the company will send you out this little um, laminated um, sheet. It's got three holes. 
And basically, the little kid puts their thumb in the first, second, or third hole, and it'll tell you which size you need, small, medium, large, okay? Um, you place it, and it's got to be fixed in. You've got to tell the parents, listen, your kid has to go to school with this, right? Because if they don't, of course, there's a chance the habit will recommence when it's not worn. Kids are fine going to school with this because other kids don't realise, they just say they've damaged their thumb, skiing, whatever. Okay, it looks like a bit of a, a brace. Um, now, the way you take it on and off, it's like a hospital brace that you, you have to use scissors. So if a kid is taking this off, they're really going out of their way to do it. I find with my experience, most kids who are sucking their thumb um, want to try and give up, but they just need something to remind them. This at night works beautifully because even if they're subconsciously doing that, they don't get the comfort. So this does not prevent them putting the thumb in the mouth. It breaks the oral vacuum so they don't get the comfort of sucking. Does that make sense, right? Um, when you buy these, they come in the small, medium, large. They come in a packet right and left. Do you follow? So when you buy them, my suggestion, divide them into two kits. Don't just give the parent both because I've very rarely found an ambidextrous thumb sucker. So you're better off keeping the left one for another kid and use the right one because the kid is sucking their right thumb. Um, Gordon Christensen in his CRA group evaluated these and came up with a 90% success in his sample because he said it's next to impossible for the child to remove. Um, and as a result, it's 24 hours a day. So that's a kid putting it in their mouth, but not getting the comfort. How do you place it? Real simple, get the right size, wrap it around the wrist, tight enough that they can't put their thumb out, but not so tight that there's blood circulation sort of gonna go off. Um, and, um, uh, and then, um, you know, now before these came on the market, the only way I could stop thumb sucking predictably was to put something in the palate, right? And if I have a patient at the moment who has been thumb sucking, say, till they're eight or nine, like your, your patient, then at the end of the day, breaking the habit is not gonna achieve much. So in that case, I'm not gonna waste money with a, one of these, I'm gonna shove a expander in, right? Because it's killing two birds with one stone. The difference in the design of the expander, I would have the Hyrax, but I'd also have these anterior wires behind the incisors for the thumb. Do you understand? So that way it breaks the habit straight away and you're doing your expansion. So when am I using the thumb guard? Kid who hasn't had the damage yet, a younger kid like yours, um, where you just want to break the habit early and that spontaneous uh, thing to it. So normally the kids who get these in my practice, five, six years old, okay? Um, do I charge for them? Absolutely. Because parents can't buy this through the internet. They can only, only doctors can vote. So I'm really charging for my time, my counselling, why I'm doing it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, the second thing is, uh, if the habit is only at night time, so parents sometimes say, look, he used to suck his thumb all the time. Now that he started kindy, he looks dumb doing it, so he only does it when he's at home, about to go to sleep, or when he's sleeping. In that regard, simple trick, put a bandage on the kid's elbow so he can't bend his elbow. Do you understand? and the kid goes to sleep um, like that, will not wake up in the, in the middle of the night, undo that just to put his thumb in. That's very effective, low cost, no fee, right? So the way I came across that technique, I, the worst thumb sucker I ever had uh, was a 14 year old kid. Um, he used to suck his thumb in class, can you believe that? Uh, um, and um, um, uh, he broke his elbow in um, rugby. And the mum said, well, the good side is he's finally stopped sucking his thumb. And so I thought, well, I've got two choices. Break everyone's elbow <laughs> or put the plaster cast on, right? So I tried that and it was hugely successful, right? But if they're doing it during the day, I can't see a kid going to school with that. Do you, you, you see? Whereas parents are happy to bandage them up when they get home. Yeah? Um, but the thumb guard, I've had... Has anyone used a thumb guard just out of interest? No one, not at all. They're not, a, not available in this country? Uh, Good God. They're on back order with the Serona 3D camera. It's not, it's not expensive. It's about $20 for the kit. That gives you two right and left. And you subdivide it and keep it. Who would agree every 
dentists in the UK needs one of these in their shelf, small, medium, large. How long afterwards do they need to wait up for? Um, normally, um, th there's, uh, Gordon Christian did the, the study, he said after four weeks, habits um, stopped and the chance of reverting. Thing. Now, if they do revert, obviously you've still got the kit there. But normally four weeks of not sucking your thumb, we're good, right? And it does, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy with this. Uh, as my first line of defence. But when do I not use this? When I need to expand the palette anyway, because then it's a bit of a waste of money, because you're going to use the expander. All right? Now, I've had a kid that I expanded the palette. They stopped the thumb ha habit during the expansion phase. When I went to braces and the expander is out, the thumb went back in. Then I went to this. So do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So each kid is different, but by and large, most children, if you break the habit for a month, they're not going to come back to it. By and large, most kids, if they're doing the right thumb and that's out of action, they don't put the left one in, by and large. You're always going to get the exceptions uh, to the, uh, the rule. Um, this is the second study they did in uh, a pitodontic office in Ohio. Um, 19 children, average age of nine, and um, they trialled both the thumb guard and the uh, finger guard and had tremendous uh, success, um, published by Professor Casamano, who is the chair of pediat uh, pediatric um, dentistry in Ohio. So it's well researched. If you want to get uh, a good reference, how to fit it, when to use it, the whole deal, I'd recommend pediatric dentistry today or the CRA group. But look, I'm just giving the evidence base saying that it does um, actually uh, work. And um, that's the reference, uh, Pediatric Dentistry, 1991. Um, just kind of showing the, uh, I've, I mean, I read all sorts of rubbishy things like, you know, there's, there's something in the literature where if a kid's sucking their thumb, you sew something on their pajamas and when they go to bed, they say goodnight to their thumb and the thumb goes, it's just shit American, <laughs> right? What used to work for me, um, I had a lab technician, this is a true story, right? Um, his name was Leo, and he used to be a wood chopper, right, up in the Queensland rainforest. So, you know, he'd, and he chopped his finger off, okay? Um, still a good lab technician, but just had no bloody finger. So when kids used to come in, right, I'd say to the mum, listen, this is what I'm going to do, don't freak out. I'm going to bring Leo in and blah, blah, blah. So Leo would come in and say, hi, how are you going? I know you're going to see Dr Mahoney. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm doing his lab work, I'm going to be making your appliances. Oh, and by the way, I noticed you suck your thumb. Well, so did I. Uh, look, I sucked it right off. <laughs> and the, the kid would like freak out, you know what I mean? I get phone calls one day later, the parent would say, Dr. Mona, I don't know what happened there, but this kid is not sucking their thumb anymore. <laughs> so there's a lot in... left the room for three days. That's the only thing. Second? So the hub left their bedroom. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> but there is a lot to be said about the power of persuasion, honestly. I have, you know, you, we've all had kids. When my kids were little, there's only two ways to motivate them. You bribe them. If that doesn't work, you scare the bejesus out of them. Y yes or no? And that's the only thing kids respond to. This sort of um, modern parenting, you know, like uh, we're going to go home and have a family discussion about this. Just get out of here, you know? Like uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not for me. Okay, let's talk about lingual freedoms, right? If we're going through differential diagnosis, of narrow palates, thumb, yeah, airway, tongue. Now, many times we assume the tongue is in a lowered position because of the airway, and that's true in most kids. But then you also get kids who are tongue-tied. Now, years ago in Australia, the midwife legally was allowed to cut or snip the large frenum the day the kid was born. And there was no anaesthetic, there was no sutures. They'd know because A, the kid couldn't um, breastfeed, and secondly, when the kid was crying, you know, the little tongue wouldn't elevate. So the lady would get out her scissors and bang, all done. Nowadays, everyone is so paranoid and scared about touching a newborn for fear of medical problems. So a lot of these kids go through. And I want you to understand, a tongue tie in 70 to 80% of cases does not affect um, uh, speech, okay? So don't wait for your speech pathologist to say someone's tongue tie. They're clueless. You do a little test. You put the tip of the tongue behind the upper incisor huh, and you open as wide as you can. Huh? They should be able to open half of normal opening with their tongue in the right spot. If they can't, for all intensive purposes, for growth and development, for function of the tongue, they're tongue-tied. Does that make sense? And removal of tongue 
ties or lingual frenums, is dead easy. You should all be doing it yourself. Why? Labial frenums, I believe a periodontist should do, because most labial frenums, the insertions are in the suture. And if you want to do them properly, you need to raise a full flap, use a half round burr, and get rid of the insertion. You understand? All lingual frenums are soft tissue. They don't touch to any bone. Do you follow? So laser, um, and write down in your things, probably a soft tissue dyed laser is probably a thousand quid uh, uh, here versus, but the best laser I would suggest price-wise, AMD. Just look up company AMD. Um, the second best one is Zap. Um, now, if Serona can do a deal, they, they also have a good, um, um, they have Picasso Light, they have, uh, there's an Odyssey, but there's hundreds on the market. But you don't, this is not like a laser to cut uh, um, bone, like, you know, not one of those water laser. Yes. It's a soft tissue diode laser. What anesthetic, hmm? what anesthetic would you be using? I just use um, uh, for, if I'm doing, say, canine exposure. Not only for a lingual. Oh, for a lingual, uh, lo local under the tongue. And um, uh, as far as uh, holding the tongue in the right position, once the local's there, the nurse has the suction on the tip of the tongue, and right. that's all you need. There's no bleeding, per se, because you, okay? um, and uh, you know, I've done it, look, in really young kids who are bloody fidgeting, I refer them out to get it done because they're done under GA, right? Um, uh, in most kids, they're quite comfortable in the child, and we ask the mum, look, has your kid ever had a filling done? Are they okay with that? It's about the same complexity and anaesthetic risk as a, 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 a filling. Does that make sense? So I do it myself because when I used to refer to the periodontist, I'm not kidding, the time it took me to dictaphone the letter, have the photo and do it, I could have done the damn procedure and got some money out of it. Does that make sense? I'm all about, as you probably realised, um, making some money. Does that make sense, right? Um, and I hate seeing other people making money. Right? On me, exactly, right? So it's, it's a bit of a religious belief. Uh, this guy, I'd like you to read his article. One of the best orthodontists um, in California. Really good, does early treatment, does a lot of peer work. And you know, what you've got to understand, when I'm in the States, the um, Western seaboard, if you like, California and all that, all those orthodontists do exactly the stuff that we're teaching. It's, it's, it's not even controversial, do you understand? You, you then hop on a plane and cross the Pacific to Australia or from New York across the Atlantic to the, and there's like a, it's a different world as far as what is done and why it's done. Anyway, this guy lives in a great place, it's called Grass Valley, isn't that a good place? Um, and um, he wrote the whole information on tongue tie, how to assess it, um, what's its significance to the growth and development of the palate, and um, the reference is this one, Journal of Clinical Orthodontics. I really want you to get that. That's one of the references that I'd like you to keep and give to parents, right? So in my practice, at least 15, 16 times a week um, between both offices, um, a parent would be getting that after the initial consult because I picked up the tongue tie. And then they're booked in um, to have records and the lingual phrenectomy note, that simple. Even before I present the treatment plan, do you understand? Because they already know, aside from orthodontics, this is pretty important and why, etc. I've never had any parent uh, balk at the idea. In fact, a lot of them say, geez, that explains why um, he didn't have any success with speed therapy. We spent years and dollars and blah, blah, blah. blah. I say, well, look, it's, it's obvious here. Um, what else is uh, important about a lingual frenum, according to him? Low incisors that are really imbricated and crowded, a lot of that's related to the lingual frenum, pulling on those tissues. In really severe lingual frenum, you start seeing gingival recession on the lingual of those lower incisors. Does that make sense, right? Um, now, one question I'm sure you're going to ask me, is there any disadvantage in doing a lingual phrenectomy? Can anyone answer that? Is the tongue going to fall out of the mouth? The answer is no. So therefore, this is a bit like your face mask uh, for your 3B. And I know you guys are into that. So, uh, lingual, lingual phrenectomy. Very important in class threes, why? If you listen to Mew, who I think has the best philosophy on postural malocclusion, what does he say? Anyone listen to John Mew about class three? He, he shows photos of class three kids and shows that yes, there might be a genetic component, but from an early age, they've got this lowered tongue position. Um, in in um, Tokyo, they did a research 
project on malocclusion based on airway obstruction, but this time looking at the site of obstruction. And they showed that kids with large uh, adenoids had more class two jaws. Kids with large tonsils had more class three jaws because when you've got large tonsils to keep your airway open, you, you're doing this, you understand? You're posturing your jaw forward. So a lot of this um, is related to the um, excessive mandibular growth problem. So there's the test. Uh, so if you are presenting a case to me um, that you think needs a labial frenum or a lingual frenum, what would I like to see? A specific photo of the lingual or labial frenum. Very good medical legally because, you know, if someone says, oh, he, he tried to con you by doing that, you didn't really need it, you can say, look at the photo before and after. What, do, what are you sort of talking about? And this is what I'm saying. This little kid, that's the, um, as far as he could move his tongue before, and that's uh, immediately after the... Um, uh, uh, lingual phrenectomy. So we take photos of that stuff and that's just to show parents um, what is normal for thing. And then, you know, th you can, these kids, it's just so funny, you say, right, open wide and try and do this. And you put your finger there, they, they can't even lift their tongue up and it's so obvious and I, I sort of have to ask myself, why the hell has a general dentist missed this one? Um, now this comes from his article, uh, Dr. Norcott, and he talks about normal what should be normal for frenums and range of motion. And um, then he goes into abnormal, kid who pokes their tongue out and rather than poke down, it goes down. Talks about tip of tongue on the lip and he talks about tip of the tongue behind the upper incisors. Now he's showing then the um, uh, procedure and um, then straight after the procedure. It's a very good article for parents to read. And, um, then he talks about labial phrenectomies. Now, word about labial phrenectomies. I do not do those with a soft tissue laser, okay? Because I know biologically that's not gonna work. Um, even though every company who sells you a laser will have a little video on labial frenum and lingual frenum, don't, don't do it, right? If you're good and you know how to do it properly, raising a full flap, gutting the suit, then do it, but it's not a practice builder. <laughs> the lingual one, it's so easy, you know? Um, youngest kid I've done, Lingual phrenectomy four uh, is my uh, nephew, and he was um, three. And it was so obvious that he was uh, um, tongue-tied, right? Um, now, why did the, um, you know, wait till they were three to get that done? You haven't met my sister-in-law. That's all I'll say, okay? Um, so the concept here, if you look at this open bite, and he's correlating open bites and narrow palates to lower tongue positions. And um, he came up with an angle where he actually, pretty good research, he measured this angle to the angle here and he realized there was a correlation. The more tongue tied, the narrower the upper jaw. And that goes hand in hand with what we're saying. Now this is a little kid. And can you see how obvious that little tongue tie is there? All these cases, you should be handling in your practice. If you want and you email me or ask me via LinkedIn, I'll give you the post-operative instruction sheet that we give after doing the lingual uh, uh, phrenectomy. Normal stuff like it's numb, don't have hot foods, hot salt water rinses, but it's, it's very straightforward. Most kids, because parents always ask the thing, oh, can you go to school tomorrow? Yes, no, no problem. It's like same sort of questions like if you do a filling for a kid, what's your post-operative instructions? Exact same for this. Huh? Don't, Don't call me. me. Yeah. Do you go in, release step, close to the tongue or close to the floor of the I start by going here yeah. and just suturing until it separates those. Suturing? Uh, not suturing. Scalping. Scalping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Above the, above now, the in some, you see, how can I put it? Behind the lower incisors, it's like a, a delta, you know? They really open that way. Fan, they're the ones that I also have to go behind the lower incisors. Most of them, I just go here. Right. And just release it as you... Exactly, yes. No, no, no suturing. No suturing. No suturing. No, so the soft tissue laser, no, no suturing. Right. In really big, thick, bulky ones, I refer them out to the periodontist. Um, so when I refer out is really big, thick ones that I know are going to need some suturing and um, nervous kid, anxious kid, anxious parent, you know, anything that is, you know it's going to backfire because you want to start ortho, they're going to have a bad experience with the lingual phrenectomy and they're going to walk. It's a, a lot of my stuff I do, people say, why? Practice management is a lot of the stuff I do. You know, that's, now, what Norcott was saying, now Norcott is another good orthodontist because he believes in early expansion. 
Um, and he was talking about kids who were tongue-tied tended to have the lower teeth like this and the upper jaw narrow. Very good observational uh, skills. And so he came up with this angle and he correlated that angle, the Northcott angle, to the um, narrowness of the upper jaw. And Bakesy said the more severe the tongue tie, the more uh, constricted the upper jaw. So there's your indication for the parent uh, why they need the lingual phrenectomy and why if they don't get the lingual phrenectomy done, will the expansion and everything really be feasible or a waste of time? Because you understand if, um, if you're doing myofunctional therapy, if a kid can't breathe through the nose or has a tongue tie and you don't address those two, how stable will your expansion be? And that's how I say it to the parent. And this is a good article for the um, understanding of the parent of, of what to do. So this is another kid who's tongue tied. Uh, again, uh, tongue can't hit the palate. Because tongue can't hit the palate, the palate has not had the functional stimulation for intramembrous ossification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That brings us on then to oral myology, okay? Right? Now, again, there is no profession called oral myologists, yeah? I've spoken twice to the International Association of Oral Myology. Basically, they're either dental therapists or speech pathologists who've decided to do a little bit of tongue thrust therapy. Yeah? So don't get all looking for an oral myologist. Look for a speech pathologist or a dental hygienist who's good in communication. Yeah? They can actually sit an exam through the International Association of Oral Myology um, and they have to do certain CE credits for that. They can do a lot of those um, lectures online now. So if you punch up IAOM.com. Yeah. Um, now there's a new association which is much stronger than IAOM in membership. It was started in Brazil and um, uh, uh, it's called the, uh, so it's very similar, I'll think of it in a minute. Jasmine, you know what I'm talking about? Reader's member of that. It's not IAOM. If you can email me and I'll forward it to all. Uh, the guy's name who's in charge of that is Mark Mola. He's um, mum is one of the best speech pathologists in the world. Her name is Joy Moller, and Joy Moller has written the book on oral myology. Right? So he's formed a new association, um, uh, and any member of that association would be the person you want to work with, whether they call themselves an oral myologist or not. That association also runs lots of courses. Um, recently in your country, um, what's her name? Sandra Coulson came out, did anyone do any, yeah? Yeah, uh, so you know, the guys who are really into this is the Mew clan, John and Mike, I think I'm saying that right? Um, because obviously oral posture has got a lot to do with this. So when do I involve an oral myologist, right? So heading, when do I involve an oral myologist? Number one, when a kid has airway problems after the airway blockage is being corrected. Does that make sense? Yeah. So airway problems, post airway obstruction clearage. Number two, when a kid is tongue tied. And if the tongue tie is contributed to the narrow jaw. Yeah. Number three, and we saw a lot of these ones yesterday, when a kid has an open bite. Do you understand if you have an open bite, you have a tongue thrust? So can we just agree on that? There's all this debate, which came first? I don't really care, right? I don't care if the tongue caused the open bite or the open bite was caused by the thumb. Um, the bloody tongue is going to get in there. Because if the tongue doesn't get in there, what happens? Um, saliva comes out. One of the tests, one of the little things that my oral myologist does, they get the kid to sip water um, and do it with their lips apart and swallow. And it's so funny watching the kid because water just comes straight out of the mouth because that kid is actually forming a seal between their tongue and their lip. What they should be doing is raising their tongue on the palatine rugae and the water or bolus should be being pushed back. Do you understand? So once you see normal swallowing, uh, you pick up exactly. Now, is there any evidence research based to support oral myology? Absolutely. Um, this is probably the best paper. American Journal of Orthodontics, 2010. And they looked at relapse of open bites in two groups of patients, 
ones that just had orthodontics with elastics and whatnot, the other group that had the same orthodontic treatment but had myofunctional therapy. Do you, do you understand? And uh, what was their conclusion? Oral myology or oral myofunctional therapy in conjunction with orthodontic treatment was highly effective in man managing closure compared to orthodontics. So that's the most respected journal. So that's what you should be showing anyone that says, ah, oh, that oral myology is all just uh, hogwash. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's not going to happen. It actually uh, does uh, occur well. No, so what is myofunctional therapy? Um, any orofacial myofunctional disorder where you have improper swallowing pattern. I think I quoted in course one the article by Rolf Frankel, British Journal of Orthodontics. Yes, no? All right, we'll write this down because this is the best description of oral myology problems. Uh, Rolf Frankel, you've heard of that name, one of the most famous orthodontists in the world. Um, he wrote one of his few papers in English. He was initially German. Um, and uh, his paper was entitled The Functional Regulatory Mechanism. So you know when people say I'm making FR3 or an FR2, FR doesn't stand for Frankel. It stands for Functional Regulation. Okay? So British Journal of Orthodontics, 1980. Rolf Frankel, very good paper. Why? Because he described how malocclusions can be caused by improper swallowing, improper tongue posture. So there's your basis of why you're doing this. Um, so a tongue thrust, which is really known as an infantile swallowing pattern, is the most common orofacial myofunctional disorder. And again, I just wish every general dentist was trained to pick a tongue thrust and know what to do because it would make it much easier to then treat later. Do you follow? I always say any habit that's not good should be broken early. So if you can break a, a kid from smoking, that first puff he has, is it easier than when you wait 40 years of chain smoking? Do you understand? Know so when people ask me, when is the best time to break an oral myological or myofunctional disorder, what's my answer? Immediately, as soon as you diagnose it in utero if you can, right? Whereas orthopedic problems, we wait until the growth of the jaw. Dental problems, we wait until full eruption of the permanent teeth. Can, can you see? So my teaching in orthodontics is vastly different to most. Most people just teach straightening teeth, using braces, elastics, whatever. And there's a need for that. But the more important need is dentofacial orthopedics, which a lot of people teach well, such as Skip Truitt, etc. But that's only, again, two-thirds. The real deal is the triple O. Now, I use that word triple O, and you guys think the lab. What does triple O stand for in the lab? Orthopedics, orthodontics. Yeah, some of that. Anyway, my triple O is orthotropics, orthopedics, orthodontics. You know what I'm saying? And if you understand, anyone from Greek ancestry here? No? Well, I'm not proud to say. Uh, uh, most of these words come from the Greek. Orthotropics, what does ortho mean? Ortho means to correct. Okay? Tropics is growth. That's John Muir's little word, right? Orthopedics, ortho to correct, pedics, bone. Orthodontics, Ortho to correct dontics teeth. Do you understand that? So a good practitioner should really be a oral myologist, orthopedist, orthodontist. How, how does that sound? There's only one country in the world where they actually get proper training in all three, and that's Brazil. In Brazil, to become a specialist, they have two specialist programs. Dentofacial orthopedics, oral myology, two years. Orthodontics, two years. And most of the people do a four-year course. And you see how like, they're well ahead of the crowd? You understand what I'm saying? And hopefully that would eventually happen here. Who would agree that any orthodontist should learn facial growth and development, oral myology, before they start moving teeth, for Christ's sake? Because who would agree that if you don't fix these problems, your orthodontics is not going to be stable? Do orthodontists agree that uh, moving teeth is not stable? Yeah? Absolutely. Look at the research. 
there's a 98% chance of relapse after fixed braces. Do you know that? That comes straight out of the study, University of uh, Washington, uh, Little, Rydell, Sinclair. We'll cover that in the retention lecture. But if we're honest with our patients and our parents, what we should say, Mrs. Jones, um, I've just done this Damon course. You're a perfect case. Be about 7,000 pounds. There's a 98% chance it's not going to be stable. When would you like to um, start? Really? Now, how many people are going to say, oh, tomorrow? Particularly in this country. Yeah. Um, so what increases stability? Well, I've shown you. The teeth need to be in a zone of equilibrium between the muscles. So one of the most famous orthodontists, um, who was the previous editor of the American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, Dr. Thomas Graeber, um, in his editorial when he became editor, he said, I'm changing the name of this journal from the American Journal of Orthodontics to the American Journal of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics. The reason I'm doing that is because in the war between teeth, bone and muscle, muscle will always win. What a powerful statement. Do you understand? So when's the best time to appraise and treat muscle disorders? Before your orthopedics, before your orthodontics. Do you understand that muscle is what influences bone? So orthopedics is made much better if the muscle works with you. Your case is a classic example. That alf might be good, the alf with the tongue, now you're talking. Do you understand where I'm, I'm going with this, right? So um, what are oral myofunctional disorders? Digit sucking, open mouth posture, um, lateral tongue thrusts, all of these improper patterns and habits can open the bite, number one, and can cause abnormal dental and facial development of the uh, child. So because of that, and this is straight from the Bible, prophet, an open mouth resting posture can lead to increased vertical height of the face. And we know that from Harvold studies. I think I covered those, didn't I, in course one? Harvold plugged up monkeys' noses with silicon for two years. Um, that's equivalent to eight human years. And he noticed those monkeys that uh, adopted this posture ended up with narrow maxillas, more crowding, longer jaws. It, this is where the rationale uh, comes from. So just kind of showing you, I mean, you should be looking at kids and realizing what is abnormal versus normal. How can you pick abnormal? Crap dried lips, mouth breathers, gingivitis. Those kids who you parents always say, doctor, um, how come my kid has these white spots? And most dentists don't even look in the mouth and say, oh, it's fluoride or uh, tetracycline. If you look closely, the teeth are desiccated. So the lip, you can almost see halfway on the incisors. The white spots are only, in other words, they're desiccated enamel. Uh, and the saliva is important, right? It's got calcium, blah, blah, blah. So um, these are the things that we look for. Now, correct tongue resting posture. An incorrect posture, where the tongue is going to rest between the teeth, can certainly prohibit the eruption of those teeth. The way we restore the correct resting position is guiding the dentition into a more sort of desirable relationship so that we have adequate freeway space and that allows us as orthodontists to align the dentition and promote more stable orthodontic results. So we get an improvement of the teeth and the face. Now, just kind of showing you a case before and after, um, nothing more than oral myology and the use of a trainer. Now, this is where, again, I have some controversy. The people who sell that little thing called a Meyer functional trainer, who's seen one of those? Right? They would have you believe that the kid just wears that, that's all you need. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely incorrect. The kid wearing that is good for night time because at night they can't do their exercises. And at night it has a tongue tag and the tongue rests in the right position. Do you understand? But during the day they need to do some oral myology. Okay? Now the oral myology that they're going to do is, in my practice is two types. They do some tongue strengthening and they do some tongue repositioning. They're the two exercises. Right? So I'm going to show you those exercises and um, uh, if you go to YouTube, um, we have put some of these exercises up from my oral myology team. Um, uh, the other great website is um, Barbara Green. Uh, 
so G R W E N E. She has all the exercises there, and they're all muchness for muchness. I mean, you might do them in different order, but they're all pretty much doing the same uh, exercise. People ask, um, what causes these disorders? I mean, is it genetic? No, it's definitely environmental. And there's your big list. Biggest one I find is the use of pacifiers. Are pacifiers popular in your country? And parents know that they do damage to the teeth, don't they? Right? Did you know that there is only one pacifier on the market that actually doesn't give you an open bite? And it's not the NUC orthodontic pacifier. Yeah? It's a pacifier developed by, again, a German. Do you know? Yeah. Right? Do you know who? Uh, no idea. Name is Dr. Rolf Hinz. I think I'm saying that right. H-I-N-Z. He's a pedodontist and an orthodontist. And um, he's developed this pacifier, which I'm going to go through, which is very clever in its design, because what it does, it um, uh, has a very thin shaft, and it doesn't have, like most pacifiers have that hard plastic here, do you understand? So not only is the size of the pacifier causing the open bite, as the kid's suckling, it's doing what? Preventing maxillary development. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And yet, they're used with gay abandon, it's un unbelievable. Now. There's one method of getting a kid off a pacifier. Um, we have this um, sort of almost like a needle exchange program in our practice. We have a sign at the front desk. Uh, if your child is still using a pacifier past age six months, yeah, see reception. And then the receptionist will say, look, there's two choices. Um, for the little kids, we use these um, HINS pacifiers. Um, and I'll show you those. There's only two sizes. Size zero, size one. Size zero, if the kid has no teeth. Size one, the moment their lower incisors erupt. Do you realise when a kid's lower incisors erupt, they shouldn't really be um, suckling anything. They should be going to one of those um, TP cups. You understand? What happens, and this is the research of, um, of Western Price. I'll just see if this is open. Western Prize notice um, an absence of malocclusion in um, primitive tribes and uh, he put it down to a number of factors, their diet, uh, nutrition, but he also said uh, he noticed that um, all the women breastfed their children for at least two years in an upright position. Now what does that mean? They didn't have access to bottle formula, mum didn't have to go back to work and therefore the kid was it, you know. Um, this is what happens in the real world, and this is why pacifiers are so endemic. Um, WHO has recommended that children should um, be breastfed for a minimum of six months, ideally 12 months, and anything more than that is a bonus. Research in Australia has shown that the average kid is breastfed for less than two weeks. Right? Why? Mum wants to go back to the workforce. It's not easy to breastfeed, and it's a real pain as far as your normal schedule, unless you're a stay-at-home mum. The other thing is, now people say, why is it that in the, um, I'll just go over this, why is it in the um, uh, primitive world, women could breastfeed and there was no problem? Uh, the research by Dr. Herman Ramirez, uh, he's an orthodontist uh, initially from Brazil. Now he's chairman of orthodontics in um, uh, Canada. Or the name of the university will come to me in a minute, somewhere in Canada. Um, uh, he did research to show that in modern countries, when babies are born, normally the baby is removed from the mum for the first night so that the mum can get a good night's sleep. The baby's put in a nursery. Does that make sense? Uh, he's shown via research and videos that when the baby's born, it should be put on the mum's belly. And he's shown videos of newborn kids crawling up and finding the breast themselves. Do you understand? Know and latching on. And his research shows that if that happens within the first 24 hours, there'll be no problems with the kid breastfeeding. So do you see why modern society has a real problem with breastfeeding? Now, why do you think these kids need a pacifier? What's, now, if you breastfeed, what are the benefits? Um, number one, we all know about 
mother's milk is the best for the baby immunologically. I'm not, forget about that. The main thing is that when you breastfeed, you can't mouth breathe. Number two, when you breastfeed, your tongue has to hit your palatine rugae, otherwise the milk doesn't come out. So effectively, what are you encouraging? Growth of your maxilla. Does that make sense? And the last thing is, after the tongue hits um, the palate, the lower jaw has to move forward to accept the milk. So you've got endochondral ossification, intramembrous ossification, nasal breathing. Hello, welcome to why um, uh, primitive man doesn't have a problem, is it, right? So what can we do? I'm not saying you need to go back and start educating all your parents about breastfeeding. That would be good. There's other associations that do that. What I'm saying is you've got to go out there like a little Nazi and say, no more pacifiers. Burn them, right? Not only that, but then it's the bottle feeding that's bad as well. You know when kids are on a bottle or a pacifier, their tongue goes downward forward. You see? So this constant use of a pacifier, this constant use of a bottle is encouraging these disorders. So let me show you the exercises that we do, then we'll have a lunch break and then I'll come back and go through the two pacifiers. Um, and this is important stuff because if you really want to understand orthodontics, you need to understand oral myology and you need to understand that oral myology is best treated when the kid's young. So in my practice, um, we used to have an oral myology unit, which is basically uh, two rooms that I converted. And of course, it never got off the ground because we were just busier than hell doing orthodontics and dentofacial orthopedics. When I moved that to another location and formed an oral myology centre, with a speech pathologist, it's gone like that. So now when I see a kid in his oral myology, I refer them out, they do the exercises, they, the girls there fit the trainers, and, and we just get fantastic results, right? Fantastic results. And I, I guess I'm shooting myself in the foot because these kids come back with hardly any malocclusions. But in the same way, we put fluoride in the water. That hasn't done right for our profession, but you know, I think it's the uh, ethically right thing to do. So I'm gonna talk to you about um, how we do these oral myology uh, things. Um, yeah. Now, this stoma adhesive wafer, you can buy from any medical supply company. It's a vegetable matter. Um, you can just cut a little hole or use a hole punch um, to make the little hole. And one part of it's very sticky that goes on the palate. Um, but I, I firmly believe in, the, I see the, put it this way, I see the damage that's done by not breastfeeding and you pacify use of it. So what I'm going to give you is a protocol. Number one, prevention. Better than cure. True interceptive orthodontics. Intercept the problem before it starts. And, you know, any notes you can get for me from your hospital group would be nice, right? Um, number two, stop the pacifier. Yeah? And backslash the um, bottle. Number three, um, put in an appliance that's going to start breaking the habit. Now, what is that appliance? For young kids, it's what's called an infant trainer. For older kids, it's what's called a T4 case. I'm going to go through all that, right? Now, the thing is that those appliances are really only worn, if you're lucky, for an hour a day. It's mainly a postural thing at night. Why is nighttime important? Because kids grow at night. Growth hormones are at least at night. So oral posture at night is more important than during the day. Does that make sense? But during the day, you want to change the poor tongue position. And that's what I'm going to kind of show you in this uh, thing. So each program, of course, is individualised. And um, the concept of treatment is to try and change the tongue resting posture and its function so that you have a closed lip nasal breathing pattern. So it all comes back to this whole breathing through your nose, tip of the tongue in the right position. Now, the most important muscle, because there is motor training involved, um, is anterior belly of digastric, right? So I want everyone to do this. I want everyone to put their tongue between their teeth. So palpate here, anterior belly digastric. Put your tongue between your teeth like you're a tongue thruster. Swallow with your tongue forward, right? Now, swallow normally with the tip of your tongue behind your incisors, back teeth together and swallow. Feel how much powerful this muscle is, right? Everyone feel that? So it's so easy to pick a tongue thruster without even looking in their mouth. You just see if this thing's working. Second thing I do, you know those photographic retractors? Put those in before the kid swallows because that breaks the seal of the lower lip. Do you understand? And you'll see all these tongue thrusts. So write down in your notes what you should do in initial consultation for all your patients, other than checking the area, giving them a chart, 
is checking their frenum, the little test I gave you, checking their swallowing. How do you check their swallowing? With retractors. So you literally get the kid, and, and the kid has to be out of the chair, because most kids don't kind of swallow like that, right? So out of the chair, right? In my medical history, I, I ask questions. How long was your child breastfed? Have they had recurrent middle ear infections? Yeah? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So you put the retractors in, you get the kid to swallow. Just say, Johnny, pretend you've got saliva or water in your mouth and swallow, and you'll see the kid tongue thrust. It's so obvious. Hmm? And the retractors goes like... Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, because their mentalis is, like, really powerful, okay? In fact, that lady you were talking about, um, uh, Dr. Osnick, she's done all of that research on oral myology. She's, if you ask me the leading person in the world in oral myology, it's her. Right? She's published extensively and it's uh, very evidence-based stuff. Um, so, um, so once you identify the problem, how do you treat it? Uh, well, I refer it straight out and I have a good team. You may not have that luxury, so I'm going to teach you how to do these exercises. They're not rocket science. The only thing is someone has to supervise. That's the problem. Like anything, you can give the best exercises, the best literature, the best videos. Is the parent and the child going to take heed? Yeah? So what happens now is that in my practice, they um, have a separate fee, a separate program, and it works really well. We give them a logbook. And what happens is... The kid, every time he does his exercises, gets a little star. At that age, that's a big deal. They then hand the logbook in at the next visit, and if they've got enough stars, they get a little prize. And that works so well for these young kids, right? Um, but for the parent, how do I sell it to them? I say, Ms. Jones, your kid has a really bad overbite here, and I can help you fix the teeth, but the teeth are not going to stay straight unless you fix the tongue problem. That's a big motivator. So in other words, I'm telling them, do you want to waste your money or not? Second thing I say for the real young kids, Mrs. Jones, um, you know orthodontics is pretty expensive. Oh, yes, Dr. Money, I heard that. Well, here's your opportunity to avoid braces. If you get in early and blah, blah, they're very motivated. Do you understand? So I'm quite good at patient communication and I understand where parents are coming from. And some parents get really upset that no one taught them this earlier. So I get a 12 year old with an open bite with a massive tongue thrust. When do you think that tongue thrust was there? From 11 till 12? Yeah? Now, I've got to be careful because I'm a specialist. All my referrals come from dentists. So I'm not going to bad mouth the hand that feeds me. But I've got to ask myself, Jesus Christ, how did he miss this? And then the parent says to me, what are the successes now, Dr. Mahoney, of us doing this oral myology? 12-year-old, not too good. Seriously. Now, adult open bites, we're going to cover those. Good luck. I have never in my entire career seen an adult open bite close with oral myology. It's never going to happen. Right? Those people, we can do the best we can as far as orthodontics, um, may need surgery, like your case. Right? Like your, your case is a classic. There's no way that girl's tongue will ever resume its normal posture. I can tell you that now. Who would agree with that? that, you know, that 14-year-old Afro-Caribbean, massive open bite, teeth are like that. The only way that will happen is with a surgical downgraft, uh, what's called a posterior maxillary impaction. The girl doesn't want to do that. So you've just got to write in your consent form. You know, uh, that tongue is going to... Now, does that mean that you don't do any oral myology? No. You just do it and hope for the best. But when's the best time to do oral myology? While the jaws are still growing, before the habit becomes ingrained. Yeah? And so trainer at night time with this little, um, uh, what's it called? Stome adhesive wafer. Thanks. Now on that point with LinkedIn. Okay, yeah, LinkedIn is great. For, honestly, LinkedIn saves me doing 40 emails, right? Okay, one thing about LinkedIn, I have like five LinkedIn groups. One is specialist orthodontists only. The other is um, students of mine around the world. The other is active MR groups, meaning mini residency. You are the UK active group. I have an Australian and a US active group. Do you understand? So when you join me on LinkedIn, please only join your group. Otherwise, it just gets confusing and you'll get a headache getting six or seven um, email. I have a girl who just does my LinkedIn 24-7. Yeah? Because LinkedIn, let me tell you, is the best form of marketing. You, you wouldn't believe the work I pick up from LinkedIn. Because I have a, who has patient LinkedIn section? Oh, that's huge marketing. Just all your patients, you must have their emails. I, that's the first thing we collect. 
we just sent them an invitation. It's things like, um, uh, if your child is not brushing well, uh, here's some tips, blah, blah, blah. Patients love that sort of stuff. They forward it to their second cousin first removed, we get the referral, right? Um, any, anything that I think is relevant, like does your child have recurrent middle ear problems and about to have their third set of grommets? If so, blah, 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 bang. It's just, it lights up, it's, it's like, it's a frightening. Like I get emails from, uh, LinkedIn stuff from everywhere around the world based on one posting I did within my patients. Do you know what I'm saying? It's word of mouth marketing. And if you want to boost your marketing, form your own LinkedIn group for your patients. It's so, so good. And then LinkedIn is kind of like weird. It, once your, your patient accepts the invitation, it then tells you, this patient is linked into all these people. Would you like to them? Yeah, it's, it's really good. So it's better than 100% better than Facebook. But LinkedIn, LinkedIn works yeah. differently. This way LinkedIn works. LinkedIn works through your emails. So I check my emails all the time. So therefore, I've got time to deal with that. And if I see something interesting, I can put my 10 cents worth in. But my staff look after my... So you know newsletters, who has patients' newsletters? No one reads that, trust me, right? No one used, reads patient newsletters. In fact, they, they love to unsubscribe. LinkedIn, you just throw it out there. Do you, do you understand? Uh, what sort of stuff to do? Like the stuff I'm talking about now, all goes on LinkedIn.